I would like to share with you before I do the pieces a poem from a book called In Depth. It is a collection of interviews and occasional poems that relate to them and, and, and journal entries and the like. And I have one in here. There was an interview where somebody was asking me what my inspiration was. And I'm like, it could be anything. And, and one of the things I even said, I'm like, I heard a song that somebody did about a girl dying at the beach. And I'm like, how trite and noxious is this thing? <laughs> <laughs> and because of that, I created this story. And this is entirely made up. But it is called, You've Left Me on Siesta Beach. Got a hotel overlooking Siesta Beach to see you. It was all so about sand and sun and fun when we were together. But after spending all night on the beach with you last night, we argued and I screamed at you, leave me alone. And you stormed away. I, I couldn't tell if you were defiant or dejected when you left me at 4 a.m. But when I got back to my hotel overlooking the beach, I couldn't sleep. I finally called your cell at 5 a.m. It jumped to your voicemail. At 6, I heard sirens. So I looked at my hotel window overlooking the beach, and I saw the lights of two ambulances and a crowd circled at the shoreline. My god, I thought. It was just an argument. We'd be OK. I can't, I can't be you. And so I grabbed my phone and my keys, and I ran to that elevator. I stepped inside, and I had heard two people talking about this unfolding news. I heard, they found a man washed up on the beach. He wasn't wearing swim clothes, so he had no life vest, so they think he committed suicide. So I ran out of that elevator as soon as those doors would open, sprinting to the beach. At the edge of the street, I, I dialed your number again and again. No response. I glanced to my right and I saw EMTs, the gurney, and I zipped with a zipped body bag. I, I ran toward that body bag. A policeman stopped me. I begged. I said, I, I, I may know the victim. So he brought me over to the EMTs. They said the man had no identification. I gulped. I, I said, I, I, I may know him. And they looked at each other and they told me to be prepared when they opened the bag. <coughs> I, I, I braced myself, and then they slowly unzipped the bag, and I looked at his face. He was bloated from being in the water so long. He, he, he was pale. Well, he was pale from no blood circulating. His eyes were wide open. I, I mean, it's not like in the movies when an actor <coughs> just press their fingers over a dead eyes, and the eyes just stay closed. So they were open, and they, and they even used, they used to put coins in there over the eyes of the dead so that they could stay closed in the old days. So, so his eyes were wide open. He stared at his vacant stare and then turned away. <coughs> I don't know this man, I told the EMTs, and they asked me if I was sure. And people look different when they die out of the water like that, they told me, and I said, that's not his eye color. And I walked away. Now, I wonder what really died that day since I never heard from you again. And because it was a longer piece, I figured I would share some new, shorter ones with you. Um, that are new. <clears throat> this one is called Other People's Worlds. After spending a lifetime looking through a camera lens, photographing other people's lives, I look at the sum of what I've done. See photos under glass, framed on walls, scenes captured with vivid contrasts and events caught in vibrant colors. And then I look at the people. Most are gripping and grinning at their imaginary, instamatic moments, but some are looking away, and it makes me wonder. I've spent a lifetime glimpsing into other people's worlds, 
when I catch them looking away, I wonder, what are they thinking? What worlds am I missing by putting this camera in front of my face, pointing and clicking, just so I can stare and wonder? First things we learn to communicate what we need to survive. You may have heard that language is a virus, but I beg to differ. It's too ingrained in us to be the enemy, to be our downfall, to be something we have to fight to survive. So no, I say language actually leaves a residue, a film that since childhood sticks with you. You can't escape the words thrown at you, the words you hear the words that you read. And some of those words may be like a virus, infecting your thoughts and invading your brain. But some words can actually, in that language, can touch you like a, a feather to gently tickle and entice you. And that language of yours can pour over you like warm honey that you could spend hours licking. Remember, language pours over you like water, like at your birth when you heard your first words. Language has touched you since the beginning until the end, and that language always sticks. Mm -hmm.